Okay guys, in this video segment, we're gonna talk about solids, uh, liquids, and how they kind of phase between those two things. So uh, here we go. Uh, first of all, when you're dealing with solids, okay, uh, in the solid world, uh, intermolecular forces, they dominate, okay? So solids don't have enough energy, um, their kinetic energy is way too low to break free of the intermolecular forces. So it doesn't matter if you're London dispersion forces, if you're dipole-dipole, or if you're hydrogen bonding. Whatever you get into that solid phase, that means those forces are strong enough to lock your particles in a rigid structure. Now that doesn't mean that they're sitting there still. They, they're still vibrating, okay? So they're still moving back and forth and vibrating and trying to break free, but they're kind of locked in place, so they can't actually do much, okay? Um, so it's kind of like... Uh, if you're at the Mall of America and you're waiting in line, you kind of you could bounce around a little bit, be antsy. But like if you're sitting in a line someplace to do something, or like a, at like an amusement park or something, you really can't break free of that line, otherwise you lose your spot. Okay, so it's kind of that idea. Um, now, because they're locked in place like this, and they don't really get a chance to move. What well, solids cannot be compressed very well. They can have a little compression, but they really uh, don't get compressed very easily. Okay, um, you kind of see what happens here is all we really get is this kind of vibrating action that goes on um, with solids. They can move back and forth, um, but they do not break free of each other. Okay. Now, one thing that does happen as the temperature increases for these things, they're obviously going to get more energy. So we know now that as temperature goes up, kinetic energy goes up. So as this kinetic energy builds with solids, they vibrate more violently. Okay. So as this vibration gets more and more violent, okay, what we do see is a thermal expansion. Okay. So as things warm up, they tend to expand because they're vibrating more and bouncing off each other, vibrating more and bouncing off each other. So things that are colder are more tightly packed together, where things that are hotter will expand. Okay. So one thing that we can say for most chemicals um, is that they warm up, they expand. Okay? There is one uh, small exception to this. Um, when you're dealing with um, water, water has kind of a weird phase into it where it actually, uh, when it locks into its crystal structure, it actually kind of goes in reverse for a little bit. But we'll talk more about that detail in our next unit. Okay, so for our now, for our general purposes here, um, we just remember that as temperature raises, things expand. Okay, and then next year in physics, you actually will calculate the coefficient of expansion and actually be able to calculate and put numbers to that. So in our class, we just kind of introduce it, hey, this is what happens. And then in physics, you actually can do calculate the stuff that uh, happens with that. Okay, now one interesting thing about about solids is that they form these different forms to them. Okay, and when you build a solid, you can actually have different structures within the same element. Okay, for example, um, this is carbon. So carbon comes in lots of different forms that actually can build these different structures to that. Okay, we call these different forms allotropes. Okay. Because of the different locking arrangement within the solids, these different allotropes actually help form different physical properties. They have different melting points, they have different hardness, they have different electrical current conduction. Um, they're very, very different. Okay, so here's just some different ones that carbon forms. You know, we have the, the classic diamond that we're very comfortable with. Um, you have uh, graphite, which is the stuff that's in your pencil lead uh, that we may be comfortable with. And there's some new ones that are being synth synthesized in labs. Uh, Buckyballs, which are basically looks almost like a soccer ball put in a tube, nanotubes, and then the most recent one is single layers of this kind of graphite they call in graphene. And this idea of graphene is actually has some really cool applications. So um, if you're interested in kind of how these things work, uh, take a look at graphene uh, or maybe nanotubes, and you'll kind of see that there's some really cool nanoscience going on with these kind of things. Uh, graphene in particular has some interesting properties of being super strong, super conductive, uh, very flexible, um, so it has some pretty cool applications coming in the computing world that we're taking a look at. That. So, but these are all different called allotropes. Now, if you have something that is not structured, not very organized here, okay, the term we use for that is amorphous. Okay, so uh, right now we have allotropes that are all very structured, but these you do have things like coal for carbon that's not very structured. That would be an amorphous solid that wouldn't have uh, those structured ability, those structures to them. Now. What happens here is at some point in your solids, you get this movement where the, that vibration gets so violent that they actually start to break free of those intermolecular forces. Okay, So when the kinetic energy overcomes those intermolecular forces holding solids together, we start to get to melting. Okay, Now in ionic solids, since the crystal lattice network has the strongest forcing holding together, okay, so you imagine that crystal lattice that we talked about before where you have your, let's just use, you know, sodium again, sodium and chlorine and sodium and chlorine 
and sodium and chlorine. Sodium chlorine, sodium chlorine, sodium chlorine, sodium chlorine, sodium. Because you have this locking mechanism between all these different molecules, or these different atoms in an ionic solid, you really don't have interlocking forces here. You really have this ionic crystal lattice that really locks this thing into a rigid structure, okay? Which means that the result is you need to have a lot of energy to start to break these pieces apart here, okay? So what happens is the ionic compounds have the highest of our melting points, okay? Now for molecular solids, okay, they're going to be lower than ionic, okay? And that's going to be, you're going to base this idea off of the size of the molecule and the type of intermolecular force. And we've already kind of talked about that in terms of boiling point and melting point. So if you have a polar molecule that can form dipole-dipole forces, assuming similar size, it will actually have a higher melting point than a nonpolar substance. Something that hydrogen bonds will have a higher melting point than something that can be just dipole-dipole if you have the same size. Now keep in mind that as you increase size, you increase this idea, this ability to be polarized. So the polar, polarizability, which is actually a word, polarizability, of a substance increases. So as things get bigger, they actually also have higher melting points. Okay? Now we do have some solids that do not melt. Okay? And we mentioned that a little bit when we started talking about IMF. Okay? In those cases where their intermolecular forces um, combining with their size lock it into place so well that you actually can start to break those covalent bonds inside there before that melting point. Okay? So um, there are those cases, things like sugars and wood and those things that, those long cellulose chains that we have, they just basically, it's easier to break individual covalent bonds than to actually separate the combination of all the intermolecular forces. Now keep in mind, the intermolecular forces are still weaker independently, but if you start, start to combine their effects on top of each other, you can get a scenario where the intermolecular forces hold on better than the individual covalent bonds, and we can start to break those individual covalent bonds, causing things to decompose versus melt, okay? So if we take a look here, here's water before it actually melts, locked into a rigid structure, and then as it starts to vibrate, if we get enough vibration, you see that rigid structure will start to break down, okay? So we get more and more vibration. You see them kind of twisting and turning, okay? And at some point here, they'll get vibrate so much that they actually start to come together and they break down. And then now, you see that they're actually movement, okay? And they start to flow past each other and they slide around. And now we've went from the solid phase into that liquid phase, okay? All right, so that's melting point. Now, once you get to liquids, okay, Liquids now have enough energy so they can slide past each other, okay, but they still don't have enough energy to, to completely break away from those intermolecular forces. They have just enough to basically break away and then be attached by another one, break away, attached by another one, break away, attached by another one, okay. Um, I kind of call this like shopping on Black Friday, okay. So you're moving around the store, but there's so much other stuff around there that you can't just walk around freely any way you want to. You actually kind of have to constantly be bumping into people and kind of working your way through the crowds and that kind of stuff. Or maybe at like a high school dance where you're trying to get through the, the dance floor where like, yeah, you can make your way through, but but you, you're not like all jammed up, okay? It's not like at a rock concert where everyone pushes towards the stage and you're locked in like a solid anymore. You're more in the back of the concert where you can move around, you can kind of fit your way through the crowds, that kind of stuff. That's a liquid, okay? So you have enough energy to do that, but you're still held tightly by intermolecular forces, okay? So don't be mistaken, this is still a holding tight by those intermolecular forces, okay? Because they're still held tight by those intermolecular forces, they're still not compressible. Okay? This is a common misconception that they, people think that liquids can be compressed, and it is not true. Liquids are not compressible, just like solids. Okay? Um, they are not able to expand like gases, but they act more like a solid under that thermal expansion idea we talked about previously. Okay? Now, because of this, liquids have this unique ability. We can actually can pump them places. We actually can push them through a pump and make them flow through pipes and out of wells, and we can push oil from Alaska all the way down to California, and we can move liquids that way. Another thing that's, that is helpful for us is all hydraulics with liquids. So the brakes in your car, every single heavy machinery that you see, excavators, bulldozers, uh, payloaders, all that kind of stuff, any industrial equipment that you're working with is going to work on hydraulics. And basically the idea with hydraulics is that you can use a small pump with a small amount of force and you can force a liquid down through a line, and then you can actually apply a big force on something else. So we can take something that's rel relatively weak, and we can actually 
generate a bigger force to move things. That's how that bit, those big equipment work, is they have a small motor, pumps hydraulics into uh, the loaders in the front, let's say of a payloader or a, a tractor and loader, something that's got a, that scoop on it, and a small force at the pump can actually generate a big force over top of that uh, load is going to lift up and carry dirt and haul those kind of things around. It's the same way like dump trucks work, how they can actually dump all that dirt out of the back of their trucks is they have these hydraulic pumps that do that. Okay. Now, if you take a look at this um, little a a animation, this is how the brakes in your car work. Okay. And again, it's very simple, but I wanted to kind of mention it because a lot of people don't really understand how the brakes work in the car. They just know they push the pedal and they stop the car. Okay. And it all has to do with hydraulics or basically this principle that, that Fluids cannot be compressed. So when you press a pr your brake pedal, and again, this is a massively simplified diagram uh, compared to what really is going on. There's more to it. But when you basically press your brake pedal, it, what it does is it presses a small pump, and that pushes liquid into this, this line. Your brake line then runs to a bigger reservoir. Okay, so a small amount of pressure by you in a small area over a big area, then your what that reservoir then is hooked to something called a caliper, and that caliper has your brake pads to it, and you have a brake disc on that. So what happens is, is you press the brakes, it pushes this, it pushes the pads against this disc, and the friction between the pads and the disc stops your car from moving, okay? Um, now there's more to this, there's actually four brake lines that go off to all four wheels, and there's a, there's a, a, a mechanical um, part of this over here that actually gives you power brakes that makes it easier to do, and those kind of things are going on. There's anti-locking systems in here, but the general idea is that you use this idea of liquid being non-compressible to actually stop your car or your brakes, okay? Now, that is liquids. So once you're in this liquid phase, you're a lot like a solid, but you're free to kind of slide around, um, and you're able to be pumped or be able to flow with those hydraulics, okay?